Back in 1949, when uh, I was six years old and growing up in faraway South Africa, my parents one day asked me to come into their bedroom and close the door. And they then shocked me with a question, are you aware that we are not your real parents? I was totally shocked. I had no recollection of that at all. I wanted to know more. My name is Harry Davids. I was born in the fall of 1942 in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, which was in the middle of the German occupation of the Netherlands. And at the time that I was born, the Germans were already running wild, rounding up Jews all over occupied Europe and sending them off to camps. In the building where I was born were living also some relatives. My father's cousin and my mother's aunt each had photographs of me in a cot as an infant. Jews were rounded up in different parts and sent to deportation centers prior to them being sent to the train stations. One of these deportation centers was a theater. Within a few months, conditions in the theater became very crowded and noisy, and the Germans wanted order, so they decided to send those under the age of 13 across the street. That was where there used to be something called a creche. It's a fancy French word for a daycare center. I was about five months old when we were sent to the creche. The people that were running this thing for the Germans had connections on the outside with Dutch resistance groups. Four different groups conspired to start smuggling kids out of the creche, one by one. The parents had to give permission for the kids to be separated from them. I found out later that the majority of the parents refused. In the case of babies, it was relatively easy to get them out. They were able to persuade the children to leave some of the dolls in the creche, and those dolls were then handed over to the mothers of the real babies so that the Germans were not going to miss the real babies. Sometimes things went wrong. For example, the children became too well known and the German soldiers across the street were bored out of their minds. So they played with the kids and they would sometimes give these kids names. When that happened, that was the kiss of death. If these children were missing, they would ask and that they would blow the whole operation. There was a tram line running through the street. Some of the children were even put onto the trams to get them out of Amsterdam and then they had to hope that nobody on the tram would say anything. Over a period of about nine months, about 600 of us were smuggled out. At the end of March 1943, my parents were taken away. They were sent to a killing camp called Sobibor. This was a gas chamber camp. In my case, I know that it took nine months from the time that I was taken out of Amsterdam before I arrived in a small town up in the northeast of Holland. Nobody in the village wanted to take me because I was so ill. And they were able to find this family of six who decided that they would take a chance with me. Everyone was scared to take me to a doctor because no one knew if they could trust the doctor. Some of the doctors were in cahoots with the Nazis. The eldest daughter had to take me. The family said to her, look, if the doctor refuses to treat the child, find a place to leave the child and get out as quickly as you can. The doctor treated me and I was better. People who rescued me were very ordinary people living in a small country town. The father of the family was an interesting man. He was essentially fighting two wars both the genocidal war and the military war because he was a gun smuggler for the resistance. He was the postmaster for the village. And he and these workers would stash pistols, disassembled rifles, ammunition and so on into cartons. The three youngest children of the family were given the same story as the neighbors, that I was a sickly young child that had come from one of the big cities on the coast that needed to recuperate from his illness out in the countryside. Because German soldiers would see me crawling around the house and the family came up with a different story for them because they knew the Germans would simply say, well, he's a boy, drop his pants and let's make sure he's not Jewish. In those days, it was only Jewish boys that were circumcised. They realized that if they told the Germans that this was their youngest child, they would probably not ask any more questions. And they could get away with that because guess what? I was born with blonde hair and blue eyes. I didn't fit the stereotype of a Jewish child. One day, the two youngest children came running in from school telling their parents that all the children at school were saying that Harry is Jewish. Everybody in the village eventually knew I was Jewish. Fortunately, none informed on us, which they could have done. You could say that they were my rescuers as well. Around the middle of April 1945, we were liberated by Canadian forces. The Dutch government passed a law that required everyone harboring refugees to turn their names over because there were people out there looking for them. They needed to prepare lists. It was only in January 1946 that my name was found on a list by my father's one cousin. All she saw was my first name because uh, no one knew what my last name was when I was taken into hiding. That's how the resistance people liked it. The less they knew about you, the better. When she saw my first name on the list and my approximate age, she thought, this is probably Harry, as she came over to our village and she identified me based on the photo that she had of me in the cot. She then contacted the cousins, two uncles and the two aunts of mine that were living outside of Europe. So that was when the eldest of the two brothers in Africa decided to come forward, only to find that my rescuing family refused to give me up. 
They said, look, this child thinks we're his family. As far as we're concerned, he's our youngest child. My uh, uncle was very upset about that because he already knew that he had lost his brother and his sister-in-law, and now he's going to lose his nephew as well. He started up a lawsuit against them for custody, which he won by the skin of his teeth. The judge who had to adjudicate this custody case, uh, he was aware of that. Everyone in the village knew I was Jewish. One day when this child starts going to school, who's going to befriend him? From a long-term point of view, he felt that the, the correct decision was to hand me over to my uncle, to my birth family and that's how I was taken to Africa. That part I have no recollection of except that I recall the plane trip. I remember arriving in very bright sunshine and I remember Great Dane, huge brother, come running to me, coming to this large house. In South Africa my role had completely changed. They have something called apartheid which means segregation. Ironically I'd now become a beneficiary of those very same things, racism, bigotry and so on, that had made me a victim in Europe. I wasn't aware at that time that there were really two wars going on. One was a military war of territorial power and conquest, fought for the most part by armed men. The other was a genocidal war fought against unarmed civilians because of who they were. For the last 67 years, I've had to do research to find out as much as I could about my family history, and that is all retained in one or more binders that I keep, which now serves as my memory substitute. If I had the privilege of being granted one memory of what had happened at that time, I would love to know what my parents were like. When you're filling out a, a, any kind of jigsaw puzzle or something of that sort, it becomes frustrating that you're missing this piece, and without this piece, how can you understand the rest of it?